Welcome to the third webinar in the SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee's webinar series, State of the Energy Industry in Europe. Dr. Adriana Ramirez, Chair of the SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee, and myself, Lori Whitesell, will serve as your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, the model for this webinar will be a short presentation, followed by an extended question and answer session. During the question and answer session, if you'd like to ask questions, please raise your hand in the webinar interface, and I will adjust your settings to allow you to ask your questions directly to the presenter. So today's presenter is Christian Johansson, who is Chief Executive Officer of TGS. He has, during his eight years with TGS, seen the company grow to become the leading global geoscience data company in the world's largest seismic company by market capitalization. Christian joined TGS in 2010 as Chief Financial Officer and became Chief Operating Officer in early 2015 before beginning appoint being appointed Chief Executive Officer in March 2016. Christian has almost 15 years of C-level experience in public companies and several board positions in energy businesses. A native of Norway, based in Houston, Texas, Christian heads up TGS's global operations with 600 employees plus hundreds of contractors. During his tenure, TGS has continued its counter-cyclical offshore investments, as well as established a strong position in the two main U.S. onshore plays, the Permian and the Scoop and Stack. Building on the asset light, multi-client business model, TGS continues to expand its data library using advanced acquisition technologies combined with innovative in-house processing technologies. Finally, Christian earned his undergraduate and master's degree in business administration from the University of New Mexico in 1998 and 1999. Welcome, Christian Johansson. Thank you for the nice introduction and uh, welcome to the webinar and thanks to the SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee for organizing the session. My name is Christian Johansson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of TGS. And as you said, we're the world's largest geoscience data company. In today's presentation, I will talk about the state of the global seismic industry, where TGS is one of the major players. So let me first uh, draw your attention to our legal notice. Uh, I'm not going to give a background on myself because you did that very nicely. So we'll go to the introduction on the next uh, slide and um, the seismic industry has gone through a period of extreme pain characterized by first of all price squeeze as an example prices of vessels have dropped from a high of close to 350,000 per day back in 2014 to a level of between 120 and 150 today there's also been a bit somewhat on, of an inability to differentiate through technology in fact all companies haven't been willing to pay a premium for technology and seismic companies haven't really been good at standardizing technology either. There's also been a lack of discipline, where we see several examples of overshooting, which obviously don't benefit anyone. We've seen financial restructuring, where big companies such as CGG have gone through Chapter 11, while smaller companies such as Dolphin went bankrupt. And as a result of the lower vessel rates, as a result of the price squeeze and some of the examples I mentioned above, we've seen significant vessel stacking in our industry. And this is not the first time that we've seen this. Yet Seismic provides a compelling and critical value proposition to EMP companies. Today we see that the drivers to the seismic industry growth are clear and on the horizon. And the big question is therefore, how do we ensure sustainable growth in such a cyclical industry? Let me start by taking you through the different seismic business models and the competitive landscape seen from a TGS perspective. So this slide shows the two main business models uh, that are that that's seismic delivers. It's a contract model and the multi-client model. So the contract model is driven primarily through tenders by oil and gas companies for acquisition and or processing services. Much, if not all, of the GNG technical work and the survey design and planning is done in-house by the oil companies. Acquisition and processing of the data may very well be split, either tendered separately or awarded separately. Work is done on service contract basis and funded fully by the old company client who ultimately owns the data. 
So this is very much a space occupied by the vessel owning seismic companies. Then you have the multi-client model. Um, this is driven by the seismic companies who generate their own project ideas, informed by the technical GMG work done by their own in-house geoscientists, as well as client interests gone by the sales and marketing organizations within the company. You look at the value chain here, you see it's, it starts with a multi-client company identifying the project opportunity. We typically go out and secure customer commitment. We, as a multi-client company, invest in and control the project. And then the multi-client company licenses data to multiple clients. For a company like TGS, who's a, a multi-client focused uh, company, uh, the multi-client model allows us to develop, invest in, manage, own and control GMG data in an area. We select the most appropriate technology to meet our clients' needs or to address a particular geological problem. We mitigate the financial risk with pre-commitments from customers prior to commencement of a project. And it creates a higher long-term earnings potential versus selling of services. And to us, this is a win-win because clients get data to a fraction of the cost and we can still make money if we're good at, at coming up with the right projects. So that's the two different business models you see. And then from time to time, you see that some old companies have been trying to do this group shoot model, which is to me very similar to multi-client. It's just that you don't have a multi-client company facilitating the projects and you have the old companies basically agreeing on doing a, a group shoot under the contract business model. To me, that doesn't really make sense. I may be a bit biased being a CEO of a large multi-client company, but you know, if you take away the incentive and all the capital that the multi-client company provide to a project, uh, you're certainly not better off. So to me, I think the industry is, is certainly much better doing multi-client and, and first of all, because we take a lot of risk to, to the project. <clears throat> if you look at the offshore seismic industry, it's characterized by many players, but dominated by the big four. And the big four players are TGS, Western GECO, PGS and CDG. In fact, these four companies represent about 80% of all multi-client spending, which again corresponds to about 70% of total seismic spending. So the greatest change to the competitive picture during the last year is Schlumberger's decision to exit the vessel and acquisition technology part of the market and become an asset-like multi-client company like TGS. This leaves only two fully integrated seismic companies in the market, and that's CGG and PGS. The second trend that we see in today's offshore market is the establishment of new startup ocean bottom nodes players. In the lower left hand corner of the slide, you see some of the established node players and there are plenty of other companies being established as we speak, trying to take advantage of the next technology development of the seismic acquisition industry. So this is obviously an interesting development that we're following very closely. If you look at onshore, uh, the onshore market is much more fragmented, especially on the multi-client side. There is about 10 companies mainly focusing on multi-clients, where both CGG and Western GECO have turned asset light during the last few years. Geokinetics has recently sold its data library to Fairfield, and it's now mainly a land crew provider. So you see the changes um, where, where we have arrows on, on the slide. <coughs> The, the fact is that seismic only represents about 2 to 3% of ENP spending, but it's very critical to industry value generation, and I'm coming back to this. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see a few statements from exploration companies where they highlight the importance of seismic in improving the probability of exploration success. So recent advancement in both acquisition, but even more on the processing side, have made it possible to detect reservoirs that were previously invisible. So personally, I believe there is somewhat of a mismatch between what risk seismic companies have taken on behalf of clients, value seismic companies have contributed with in terms of exploration success, and the way that our industry has benefited or lack of benefits, because of the benefits to our industry have almost been non-existing if you look at the industry as a, as a whole, and I will come back to that later in the presentation. The fact is that seismic offers a compelling value proposition to ENP companies, and this slide summarizes four of, of the reasons why, why seismic is a signif significant uh, value uh, proposition for, for our clients. First of all, it's a, it's a great way of outsourcing risk. So you, that, whether it's outsourcing of staffing, logistics or maintenance, operational risk management, of course, 
but probably most importantly, the capital investment and utilization risk, which is now carried out by the seismic companies. Secondly, there is an exploration de-risking, which again maximizes rec reserve recovery. And if you look at the bar chart in the middle under the second bullet point, you see the evolution of the multi-client area. This is just an example from TGS where you show how we have developed an area in the Atlantic uh, margin in, in Norway over many, many years, where it typically starts with gravity magnetics or multi-beam or some very relatively cheap product where we do regional interpretation of that. We do 2D seismic on top of that. We do another interpretation obviously of the data and then it, it all ends up either with very advanced 3D or it ends up with eventually with, with ocean bottom nodes. So this is a, a great way for us to de-risk a basin and it's very much financed by the seismic company rather than the old companies. Thirdly, the multi-client business model is based on cost sharing and collaboration. We're all talking about collaboration and sharing economies outside oil and gas. I think this is a great way or a great example to show that we, we have the same in, in the seismic industry. If you look at the bar chart there, you see TGS investments over uh, the past three years and how much is invested by TGS balance sheet and how much the clients have invested in our projects. And you see that the majority of capital is actually funded by TGS. So in many, and if you look at the difference between 2015 and 16 and 17, you see the blue bar has almost gone down to about one third, which means that clients have been very reluctant to fund new investments. While TGS has basically kept up the investments because we see that during a down cycle like this, we can actually help our clients with continuing to acquire new data and then we were kind of bridging the, the cycles for on behalf of the clients. It's a great way for clients to, to get the data they need, but, but offload some of the financial risk and the operational risk to a, to a multi-client company. And then lastly, it's an industry-driven technology innovation. There's a lot of great examples to that. We have a track record on this industry of game-changing innovations, multiple versions of similar technologies, and new entrants bringing fresh ideas and innovation to the market. So let's have a look at some of the seismic industry challenges we're facing. So first of all, ENP companies have been very successful commoditizing the seismic industry. It, they, it's turned into a very procurement-led buying process, which means that when we are selling or licensing seismic data, we talk to a lot of the same people in an old company that are in charge of procurement of laptops or IT equipment. And, and that is a significant change to what you've seen in the past. There is no price premium for technology differentiation or very low price premium. Proprietary contracts are converted to multi-client to drive down pricing. EMP company-led group shoots, as I was indicating on a previous slide. And then overshooting of libraries that have sometimes been encouraged rather than trying to get the best value out of existing data. And I think this is very well um, highlighted by the quotes under, underneath the picture where Paul Kipskar, the CEO of Schoenberger, explained the rationale for exiting the marine contract part of Seismic back in January 2018. So what he said is that our customers are unwilling to pay a premium for differentiated seismic measurement and surveys, and they clearly believe that generic technology and performance is sufficient. The result of that and the result of the commoditization and the, the significant cut in seismic spending over the past few years means that nearly 35% of the 3D seismic vessel fleet remains coal stacked. And not only that, but in addition to that, so that's, that represents about 17 out of 55 vessels. But in addition to that, there's currently about eight, 11 vessels in port or in transit or just waiting for work, which means that about 60% of available capacity now is not working at all. And it could have been even worse because the seismic industry has been quite good at cutting and scrapping capacity. So we, at the peak, we had about 65 vessels. As you see, the total capacity today is down to 55, which means that 10 are, are gone forever. But then there's another 19 that are cold stacked. And if you look at this compared to other old service industries, seismic has been quite good at, at um, stacking capacity in the, in the, in the down cycle. But it doesn't help much because uh, despite the fact that we've cut down the capacity to about half of what it used to be, as you see on this slide, you see the blue bars, that's a number of vessels operating. And if you, if you look at the prices illustrated by the blue line, you'll see that despite the fact that we've reduced capacity overall in the industry by about 50%, prices have dropped even more. So 
it, it's certainly a necessity to do such a, a dramatic change in the in the supply model based on the significant cut in seismic spend. And the result is that the industry has lost about $4.5 billion during the last three years. And these, these are just the, the publicly listed companies that we have available numbers for. But I guess if you added West and GECO to that picture, it would probably look even worse because they probably don't shut down their marine contracting business because it's making a profit. So it's probably making a loss as well would be my my uh, interpretation of that, which means that we were talking about losses of four and a half billion dollars plus only during the last three years. Which is not very unusual. In a, in a significant down cycle, you see most industries actually losing money and also losing money on a cumulative basis. But the in interesting thing with Seismic is that we've never really made money. So if you look back and, and return on capital employed, which is basically your, your profitability divided by your, your capital that you have employed or your asset base, you see that from 2010 to 2016, and keep in mind that 10 to 14 was a significant upcycle in oil and gas. The oil price was about $120 um, dollars per barrel. But even in an upcycle like that, seismic companies as an aggregated industry were not able to make money. So the returns were between 5 and 10 percent. But keep in mind that the cost of capital, so the cost of capital is about 7 to 10. So unless you generate a return that is higher than your cost of capital, you basically value destructive. So that has been the case for many years and, and something that we have looked into. Why is the industry loss making over time? Well, again, let me refer back to Seismic represents only 2 to 3% of EMP spending, despite being one of the most critical components for EMP value generation. I think if we go into ourselves and look at our industry, I mean, there are certainly things and certainly issues that we have to fix. And then there may be something on the client side as well. Um, the, the seismic industry issues are as follows, in my opinion. First of all, very low barriers to entry over time have resulted in too many vessels and seismic crews. It's a non-consolidated seismic market with relatively low willingness to collaborate. So if you look at all companies drilling a well, you hardly ever see one single oil company drilling that well. But for some reason, you see seismic companies doing multi-client surveys on top of each other because they cannot really collaborate. And I, and I think that's just a sign that, that we're, we're not good at collaborating in our industry and nobody benefits from that. And I think we as an industry have to look at our client base and see how they have actually been quite good at collaborating to share the risk among multiple players. Weak balance sheets lead to price pressure, too much focus on short-term market share and utilization rather than return on capital, and a relatively low degree of standardization. I think that's kind of summarizes some of the key issues that we as an industry have to deal with in order to be more profitable and less cyclical for the future. And then obviously we could blame our clients too, but keep in mind that clients have been through the same down cycle. I mean, clients are pushed by their investors in terms of cutting costs. And given that 80% of their of a super major cost level is actually external cost rather than internal cost, that cost cutting obviously will, will impact the service industry as well. But it's a fact that all companies have been unwilling to pay for technology. The procurement departments are focused mainly on cost rather than technology or value proposition. And there's in general a lack of understanding and appreciation for sharing economies such as multi-client. Although I would say that we've seen a clear change in the last bullet points over the past few years where more and more all companies see the benefit of having a multi-client company operating, facilitating, but more importantly take off some of the financial risk to a new survey. So let's turn to the more positive side of the presentation. A recovery is coming. It's um, clear that the current exploration activity is not sustainable. If you look at the organic replacement ratio over time, and this goes all the way back to 94, it's never been lower. And it's been as low as, you know, in the, in the low 20s in 2015, slightly higher in 2016, and the 17 is probably going to be around the same. So it means that for three years now, we've seen a replacement ratio that is actually record low in a historical perspective. And that again leads to an average reserve life that is coming down year after year. So you see the average reserve life peaked back in 2013. And since then we've seen a, a steep reduction in the reserve lives. And that will continue in 2017, going to a level which is very near all time low, which again means that there will be pressure on all companies to renew their, their reserves and build up new reserves in order to continue to grow in the future. 
So we, we foresee that in the future there will be more push now for growing and the way to grow a business would obviously be to spend more money on, on exploration for the long-term future and, and potentially less focus on, on dividend and less push on, on dividend because it's kind of a short-term measure. If we look at the fundamentals of the industry, um, you see that Brent oil price has obviously seen a significant rise. You see that trough back in February 2016, where the oil price reached a level of 27. And you see where we are today in the mid 70s. So it's been a, it's been a great momentum in the oil price. Substantially lower cost for the super major, so pretty much all the EMP companies. So you see the break even cost level has come down to somewhere between 50% and 70% of what it used to be. And the result of that is a significant boost in cash flow. So you see all companies are making far more money today than what they did when the oil price was 120 because of the fact that the break even cost has come down. So I mean, all these factors point to a better market for seismic in the future. And we're pretty certain that that's going to happen. And we've already seen results of that in, in uh, Q4 of last year and Q1 of this year, where we see that the market is, is gradually picking up, which is obviously good for all of us. So the big question is then, how do we make this recovery sustainable? So first of all, EMP companies acknowledge the importance of collaboration. They're all talking about collaboration, in, you know, sometimes collaboration between the different EMP companies, but even more important, how can they collaborate and build new business model together with the service industry? And we hope this is something that they don't talk about only when the market is down, but also something that is sustainable when the market comes back again. Because we strongly believe in, in collaboration and we think that our industry and particularly that part, the multi-client part of the industry is actually built on collaboration. So EMPs are seeing the benefits of that. It's a cost sharing between all companies facilitated by ourselves. We're willing to take a share of the investment cost where they can make a fair return. Libraries provide quick, easy access to data. The industry can support a sensibly sized fleet and land crew through the cycle. We frequently use uh, tests and prove new technologies, strong incentive for the multi-client companies to apply new technologies in mature basins, et cetera, et cetera. And what you see from the bar chart to the left here, you see that all the seismic spending, so this is the, the global EMP's total seismic spending back in 2013, it was about $9 billion. That's what they spent on seismic. And you see 38% of that was a multi-client and the rest was basically contract seismic. That has completely changed. So in 2017, the total spending has dropped back to about $3.6 billion. But you see most of it, or if not all of it, is, is multi-clients, which proves that they see the value of multi-client in a down cycle. And now it remains to be seen whether they can see that same value proposition when the market turns more positive. I also think that the industry can be more creative and we can see more opportunities based on the huge amount of data that we already have. So what we say on this slide is that the industry will gradually move to doing seismic services, to multi-client data, and then potentially to a data-driven solution where we basically go one step further in the value chain in terms of providing a solution to our clients. So the EMP industry produces an immense quality of data, much of which is actually unavailable to EMP decision makers and never used. And sometimes if you ask the super majors, they don't really know what kind of data they have, and they don't really are, they're not able to use data across offices very efficiently. So this is something that the industry can certainly um, develop better solutions for that, and, and certainly in line with all the trends you're seeing now in terms of cloud computing, in terms of machine learning, artificial intelligence, et cetera. So as the industry grapples with how to extract value from its data, two trends are becoming very clear for our industry. First of all, demand for data, structured, accessible, and on demand will only increase. And we think this will increase significantly for the future. And we think there are opportunities to deliver solutions to directly to our customers. I, I don't think that you will see, you know, the super majors, uh, the global super majors buy a lot of solutions from the seismic industry or the data industry, but I think there's a lot of smaller companies, especially you as onshore and elsewhere in the world, who don't have the capacity to do some of this and who would eventually look at new business models of licensing seismic. And that could be subscription-based models with, a, with, with some data analytics and, and solutions. So from data to solutions, we think we're uniquely positioned. We know our data better than anyone else. We have the largest data libraries, the widest geographic scope. We have interpretation expertise. And obviously the whole industry is now looking into how can we 
extract more value from machine learning and, and artificial intelligence in terms of the interpretation of data. And obviously, last but not least, we have great computing expertise and, and also great computer power. So to summarize my presentation, our industry appears to be climbing out of one of the most severe down cycles in its history. We're all familiar with the extreme boom bust cycle of seismic and there is a desire to fix it. We provide something of critical value to EMP companies for which there is no alternative, but the cost is still very low. The acceptance and application of the multi-client model has grown to record levels and presents at least a partial solution to the enduring challenges of our industry. And last but not least, collaboration across our industry, investment discipline and data-driven solutions present opportunities for a more sustainable seismic industry. So with that, I will uh, open up for your questions, please. Thank you, Christian. Okay, I have uh, moved uh, a uh, participant, uh, Greg. I'm going to unmute. No, oh, where'd he go? I have. Hang on. Sorry. Please raise your hand in the interface. And if you uh, can't raise your hand, uh, please provide your comments in a chat. All right. We have a question. From Marianne. Marianne, please uh, go ahead and ask your question directly. Marianne, go ahead. All right. So um, I'm going to unmute. Marianne, go ahead and ask your question, please. All right, let's uh, move on. We'll give her another shot in a little bit. Okay, I do have one question that uh, came in. Um, <clears throat> the recent economic downturn largely affected the contractor industry. Um, TGS offers acquisition and processing of seismic data, but does not own seismic vessels. Um, how does this uh, factor affect the economy of TGS uh, during the downturn? Christian, you're muted. So it's, it's, uh, it's been a good strategy for TGS. We went into this down cycle with an asset light business model and we had, we had no debt going into the down cycle. And I think that combination has been, has been very good, but obviously it's, it's been challenging for TGS as well. I mean, we have uh, obviously a lot of people and I'm very sad to see that we had to let a lot of people go during this down cycle. We, we prepared for a, a long down cycle when we saw this come back in 2014 and 15 we uh, we, we started to prepare for a, a lower for longer alternative and we had to to reduce our cost base quite significantly so despite the fact that we didn't have vessels which was obviously a good thing at the time we had we certainly had our issues too we have obviously significant processing capacity that we had to to, to take down in line with the overall markets so it's, it's been a challenging market for all of us but obviously probably better for TGS and most of our peers, given that we didn't have that and, and we didn't have a, a big fleet of vessels. I have a question. Uh, as you mentioned, and as we have seen in the industry, we are seeing more companies, uh, more integrated companies in the service industry moving to a multi-client area, both onshore and offshore. And this, I mean, in spite of the business uh, model that they're choosing, there is a small uh, danger of losing investment for research and development for acquisition. Uh, what is your view on this? Do you think we have a healthy 
level of research and development in acquisition? Is there something that should be done? Yeah, I, th I think it's a, it's a very good question. And, um, and I, th I think, you know, in any kind of industry, you need to focus on what you're best at. And um, you see in other industries, people are, or, or companies are very specialized to, to their core business. And, um, you know, all companies used to be hugely diversified. They used to have their own seismic acquisition in-house, and they used to have big processing centers, and they basically did this them themselves. And then over time, all companies have been really good at, at becoming more asset light and they're outsourcing a significant part of the, the asset heavy services. So all company would never own their own rigs today and they would certainly not own their own seismic fleets. And that's kind of how the industry has developed over time. And what we see most recently now is that within the seismic industry, we also see that companies are really specializing on what they do best. And, and from TGS point of view, we look at the data part of business as being core. We're a data company rather than a service company. And that's what we've always been since we started the company back in 1981. And that's what we always going to do and focus on. And then there have been some companies who have a much more kind of integrated business model where they see the value of, of owning the vessels, but they also have a multi-client business. And over time, that's not been a very good combination if you just look at the financial side of it. But then the interesting question is obviously, okay, but someone's got to own vessels and someone's going to invest in acquisition technology. And I, I, think, I think the market will adjust itself over time. I think some companies realize that that's what they do best. And over time, you will actually make money if you're just very, very focused on what you're good at. And there will always be a need for that. And the fact that TGS is asset light and we don't you know, necessarily own our own vessels, it doesn't mean that we don't develop technology because we actually spend a lot of R&D money on developing even acquisition technology but we do that in, in alignment with our partners and we work very closely with some of our our suppliers to develop technology so we have very interesting discussions with nodes suppliers because we see that that could be the future and we make sure that we 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 help them develop technology and certainly help them to commercialize the technology so there are many ways to to think about this um, but I think you you will have to to let the industry adjust over time. And I think, I think it will all be good because if all the companies focus on what they're best at, there will be some pure play shipping companies in the future, like you see in LNG or you see that in, in other uh, shipping industries. You see that some companies are doing the shipping part of the market and some companies are doing the data part of the market. And I think that's how it's going to play out for the future. Do you foresee more specialization in the industry, perhaps? Yes. Thank you. Okay, well, we have a, a question from one of our attendees uh, from in the chat. And uh, the question is, prospective areas are offered by governments to oil companies in blocks by bidding rounds. These blocks are then developed by oil companies for exploration and oil extraction and are not shared by oil companies uh, to other companies. How um, does a multi-client business model work in that situation? Yeah, it's obviously more challenging. So, but you still see multi-client activity over held acreage, and and um, it's not the traditional way of doing multi-client, where the multi-client co company comes up with an idea and they shoot seismic, and then they license that to multiple parties. But you will still see that there could be interest for doing multi-client over held acreage. Typically, the trigger to that would be that you see that down the road, or two to five years down the road, there will be some some farmings. To that acreage so that will obviously present an opportunity to sell sell more data uh, but what we also do quite successfully as an industry is that we we use that so we take advantage of, of that particular block that is already controlled by one company but then we combine that with a bigger survey where you could touch into some open acreage and create a very good multi-client product so we even if we focus on multi-client we're very keen to look at opportunities to turn bigger proprietary surveys over health acreage into multi-client we see great uh, potential to to do that as well okay uh, we have uh, another question the exploration industry is starting to use more ocean bottom uh, seismic nodes for exploration how does tgs uh, view this business area yeah, we look at ocean bottom nodes as, as very interesting. And I, I just showed a slide today where you see how the industry is, is kind of broken up in different areas. And, and it's probably the, 
the highest growth area right now where you see a lot of, of small startup companies being established. You see a, a greater appetite for the, from, from, from our clients to do ocean bottom nodes. And we still have a way to go in terms of getting the efficiency down or up to a level, which means that the cost can, can be justified for, for bigger multi-client projects. Uh, but I, I think, you know, if you just look at the development of cost over the past three years, I think it's been it's certainly going in the right direction. And I would be surprised if you don't see more and more ocean borrow nodes activity, uh, certainly in some of the mature basins where we are very active over the next, you know, year to, to three for sure. So, so this is certainly, you know, very good for our industry in general, you know, we always get the question, I mean, isn't the whole market now covered by seismic and uh, how, how are you going to continue to grow the company? And, and we had the same question actually back in the 80s where we talked about, you know, the whole world being covered by 2D and then we got 3D data and we covered basically the same world with 3D data and we've done it with wide azimuth and we, we are dependent on this kind of technology developments. So in terms of ocean bottom nodes, we're following that development very closely and we're actually working very closely with some of the key players there to make sure that they can commercialize their business and be successful in the future such that we can apply their technologies in multi -client. Great, thank you. Um, anybody else have questions for Christian? I don't see any hands raised. Hmm. That's, that's strange. I, I have another question. You talked about standardization, and I, I, I actually agree in the sense that standardization can definitely help with costs in this industry. And we're not always very good at it, and it makes sense because, I mean, the business, the differentiation is part of this business. Where do you foresee more benefits for this industry in terms of standardization, where would you try to, to encourage this kind of strategy? I, I gotta be a bit careful because some of these uh, suppliers are, are very, very good friends of us. But uh, I, think, I think in general, if you look at all the money that have been spent on R&D and especially the acquisition part of our business, so acquisition of, of seismic data, uh, I think it's fair to say that a lot of those initiatives have failed over time. Clients have not been willing to pay for it. And, and I think if you ask 10 clients, there would be very different answers in terms of, you know, how differentiated is that technology and how much premium are we willing to pay for the different technologies. I think if you look at all the investments that have been carried out by the industry over the past 10 years, I, I guess we can, we can probably call it a, 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 a big disappointment. So I think when you, when you invest that much in technology and you don't get the premium over time, you will have to look at the standardization of, of that rather than trying to create something that is very unique from time to time. So I, I think when, when I say that the industry needs to standardize, I think it's, it's mainly on the, on the acquisition side where we see a lot of R&D money has been spent without really getting the benefits that you would normally expect. Okay, thank you. Larry, are there any other questions? Uh, no one else has their hand raised. Um, so I, uh, I don't think we have any more questions. Well, then I will just ask one last question. Uh, we, have, we have students uh, connecting to, to this presentation today. And they have also had a hard time taking a decision of staying in this field they find trying to find jobs, the ones that recently graduated, etc. What would be your words as CEO of TGS for younger professionals, recent graduates and students thinking whether or not to go for a more specialized degree in this field or related field? I think it's a great question. I think it's probably one of the biggest challenges we have right now as an industry is that we've seen a whole generation of, of G and G people retired over the past five years. I mean, this, this recent down cycle that we have been through has been brutal to the whole industry. And I think it may be one of the biggest challenges now when the market turns is how do we get access to, to, um, to, to good people. And, and I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people who are coming out of college and people who are, you know, at an early stage of their career is that this industry is, it is still going to be a boom and bust industry. So if you, if you seek 
if you're the person who seek 100% stability at any point of time, it may not be the industry for you, but I think it's a very, very exciting industry that will continue to grow over time. There will still be significant demand for oil and gas. There are still no good substitutes for oil and gas. I'm, 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 I'm part of the people who would say that this is an industry that will continue to grow and be very, very exciting to, uh, to work in. And, um, I also think some of the technology development that is taking place and, and most recently within machine learning, artificial intelligence, I think, I think there are tremendous opportunities for us as an industry to be a, a very attractive employer to, to people are, who are at an early stage of their career. And, and again, I think they're in, a, in an excellent position to, uh, to pursue a career within oil and gas. So I, I welcome you all. Thank you very much. Uh, Christian, Christian Johansson, thank you very much for, for your talk and thank you all for attending the SEG Europe Regional Advisory Committee's webinar as part of our series, The State of the Energy Industry in Europe. Uh, please respond to the webinar follow-up email. Let us know what you liked, uh, what you, we could do better and any suggestions for future topics. Uh, we will also have posts in social media to register for future webinars. And one more time, I would like to thank you for attending today and thank you, Christian Johansson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.